live from Orlando, Florida. It's the Q covering ServiceNow Knowledge 17. Brought to you by ServiceNow. We're back in Orlando, Dave Vellante with Jeff Frick. Pat Casey is here as the Senior Vice President of DevOps and more at ServiceNow. Pat, good to see you again. Yeah, absolutely, it's fun to be back. It's been, been quite a week, hasn't it? It has been quite a show. Yeah, I think 15,000 people, give or right, take. Right. And first time in Orlando, I was also just really shocked walking the expo floor. It was crowded down there, that was fantastic. Yeah, and obviously the next chapter of, of ServiceNow, and you've seen them all, I felt like, you know, CreatorCon today, people were really excited to hear what, what you had to say. You know, sort of the, the cultural link to the roots of yeah. ServiceNow. Well, I think the, you know, the common theme that's always been there at ServiceNow is it's always been about making it easier to do things that used to be hard. You know, Fred started that way. He wanted to make it easier to build business applications. And I think he really, really hit that ball really out of the park. And then we built all the applications people know and love, you know, incident, problem, change, but it's not enough these days. So we're trying to bring that same sort of approach of simplifying to today's problems. You know, you still have a time series database, it's big time IoT problem right now. You saw the machine learning. So it's really about making stuff accessible, but keeping that kind of service now vision of regular people. We hear tons of talk about platform, right? What makes a platform a platform? Oh. I actually have a slide I do on that. It's, it's a picture of an oil rig and says, is this a platform? And <laughs> it sort of is in yeah, a sense. I guess so. <laughs> um, the way we define it, and I'm going to sound like I'm reading a definition, but it's a good place to start. It's the software and hardware that builds fundamental services that people use to build applications on top of. So it sounds less like I'm reading from a dictionary. It's the underlying stuff people use to build applications as distinct from the application itself. So it's, it's UI, it's persistence, it's workflow, it's business logic, it's storage and retrieval. It's all those underlying guts. You have all that, you know, the world's your oyster. People are going to build cool stuff. The part that I love, it's, and it comes up again and again with you guys, now the machine learning, is complex buzzword. People talk about it all the time. You find really simple ways and elegant ways to integrate that functionality into what are relatively straightforward processes that are mundane and painful, and, and it's you know, the value delivered compared to kind of the, the sexiness of the application, if you will, is so high, like in categorization and, oh, yeah. and some of these things that you guys are attacking. I mean, it, it solves real problems for real people, and that's, that's fundamentally where we're at as a company. We're not a hype-chasing company, we're not a marketing-driven company. You know, we're a delivery driven company. We want to deliver products that our customers can turn on and use. And if you look at a lot of the work people do in the service management space, there are parts that machines can do. Uh, the routing, the assignment, the categorization, the prioritization, and they won't be able to do all of it because the technology is not there, but hey, if I can do 50% of it, think of what that frees up humans to do. Like, we're not going to waste our time on mundane things anymore. We can work on higher value things. And that's really where we see the push in the service management space over the next, call it five years. It's around getting that better efficiency, getting the boring stuff out of there, and letting people focus on the more important stuff. Well, we've been trying to bait you guys to talk about big data for five years, and you know, it really didn't, wasn't, didn't seem to you know, be a relevant topic of conversation. You know, now the big data hype cycle is kind of over, and now you're talking about sort of applying machine learning to a big, really hardcore yeah. big data app, which is, as Jeff was saying, I love the, the practical example there. And my question is related to the dogma of the platform, and I don't necessarily mean that in a pejorative way, but you guys are pretty OCD about making sure it's in the platform. And yeah. other platforms, you know, you see a lot of bolt-ons and. Talk about your philosophy there and why it's so important for customers and developers. I've done it both ways. You know, in my engineering career, I have run companies or been fairly senior in engineering where we grew by acquisition and we integrated with PowerPoint. And what I found out was that it worked great for about 18 months and then your customer started complaining. They said, you sold me this suite that's not a suite. It's five distinct things that you then have to pay professional services or you know an Accenture or somebody to wire together for you. 
why should I do business with you as a unitary entity? I could just buy piecemeal and get the same outcome. And as an engineer, that was really sort of depressing. Ouch. It, yeah. it was a little bit of a kind of Bernstein Bears moment. Like, I know now how not to do it. You know, it's, and Fred went through the same thing with me, frankly, because that was at a company we both used to work at. At ServiceNow, you know, we had a very, very strong vision that we wanted one platform. And we have made the decision that when we buy technology, we will take the hit. You know, we will say, hey, look, we bought DS Continuum and we're not going to sell it right away. We're going to take the time and the energy to replatform it so that when we do take it to market, it's a really good integrated solution on platform. It's not a bolt-on, to use your phrase. And yeah, it may delay our time to market in some cases, but we think the ultimate value is certainly offsets the delay. Well, I mean, it's, it, you wonder these days, you know, talk about first mover advantage. There's so many examples of first movers who didn't get the advantage. It's, it's, I, I hate to even ask this question, but is time to market overrated or is it overrated in a situation where you have a platform that's installed with a bunch of loyal customers? I would say, honestly, somewhat contextual, but I think you, you've got time to market. It also, especially because we're in the enterprise space, mm -hmm. at some level it has to work. Um, so if you're there first, but it doesn't work, it's not a great situation. And you know, maybe the archetypal example of this is, you know, years and years ago, eBay was just dominating. Uh, they're growing. It's before they're quite the colossus they are now. Uh, but they, they don't dominate in Japan. And oddly enough, they were delayed six months going into Japan because they had to spend all their engineering resources basically making the stuff they'd already bought and sold work. And that six month delay let somebody else, actually a local Japanese company, really take over the auction market in Japan. So for us, it's really key that anything we release, it has to work. Um, so we'll, we'd rather be second with a working product than first with the PowerPoint deck. So the other thing, Pat, that keeps coming up, especially some of the older customers, is you know, kind of con customization versus configuration and how much of best practices are represented in what you guys deliver out of the box and, and making upgrades easy. And it, it's interesting because a lot of the early people you know, kind of built their mods, oh, now yeah. they're telling us you know, all that stuff now is, is stock out of the box and we purposefully don't want to do mods anymore. We want to do configs to make upgrades easier and to presume that you guys, because of your breadth of experience, so many customers are baking in best practices in the standard out of the box processes. So it's a great opportunity for you guys to help them do better out of the box, but more importantly, as upgrades come out, come out, come out, you know, execute those at a much faster rate. Yep, well we definitely have heard the same thing from the customer base, and I think you've got two kind of related dynamics working out there. One is absolutely that we're expanding the breadth and the depth of our application. So there's more there. So our customers have a, oh, there really is an out-of-box solution. Whereas, you know, 10 years ago, we were just, before we even IPO'd, you bought a pretty skeletal app and you had to customize it. I think the second piece of it, though, is, you know, the part of the market we're selling to has shifted. You know, early on, you sell to early adopters. Early adopters will fix your installer for you and mail you a patch. <laughs> You know, they really, they enjoy being part of a technology journey with you, and they like configuring, that's a benefit to them. You know, right now we're right in the middle of kind of the center of the marketplace. You know, we're selling to companies who are not early adopters, and they've generally said, hey look, we want value in the platform, but when we're buying an app, we want value not just in the configurability, but also in the as shift functionality. And for our old customers who have got all this customization, a lot of them are actually running projects to unwind that. Right, and that's right. something we're you know, very supportive of. We can help do that, but there's no magic bullet. It, take, it took you work to get it in, it's going to take you work to get it out. Probably less, but some. So I've got to ask you kind of a personal question here. You know, Sean Convery was on the other day saying, you know, his inspiration was when he was a kid, he saw some you know, evil doer and he wanted to save the world. And you know, that's how he sort of got into the security business. Jeffrey Hammerbacher, you, you know, quips that the greatest minds of our generation are trying to get people to click on ads, right? You're a developer, coder, software engineer, programmer, you gave all those names today, and you're somebody who has the capability of changing the world, and you're changing the world. The world you're changing is, you know, don't hate me for saying this, but it's kind of boring but really important. Um, but ServiceNow seems to be this platform that's permeating virtually every company and type of company in the world and you're, you're creating new ways to work. And, and what are your thoughts on your ability to affect your customer's ability to change the world? I don't, when I was a kid, actually, I wanted to build physical things. 
and I went to college as a mechanical engineer. I thought I was going to build like you know caterpillar tractors, and I, in my head I wanted to build earth-moving equipment and dams and buildings and bridges. And I kind of realized a couple of things. One was, at least in the U.S., we don't build a lot of that stuff anymore. <laughs> you get to build like three bridges in your life if you're a bridge architect. Um, the second piece of it, though, is that less and less of that is what I'll call tactical, uh, tactile engineering. You don't touch it with your hands. It's more done with extreme math, with computers. And, you know, the world of kind of creative production, the world of actually engineering things to change people's lives, I do think a lot of it's shifting out of the physical into the kind of the software world, the virtual. And for me, I found that I was feeling more fulfilled writing software than I was you know, trying to build a new digger blade on a Caterpillar tractor. This one reason is simply it's faster. I mean, it takes you 18 months to iterate on like big earth movers. You can iterate on software in 18 minutes and get that immediate feedback from the customers like, wow, that, that's better. And like, okay, I'll keep going that way. So I always felt like I could get a better outcome with software than I could with physical. I will admit at some level, I go, I visit like the Hoover Dam and I look down there, the thing's massive. Wow. <laughs> I'm like, man, I really wish I had built something this tactic, this visible that I could take my kids to. So I want to ask you as well about something we talked about the other night at the, the analyst event, um, which was the impact on you know, cognitive machines replacing humans. You're concerned about it, I'm concerned about it. And you know, we were talking about education and it's kind of a bromide, we need education. But I always tell my kids, learn how to code. You <laughs> it know? helps. You can't go wrong, learn how to code. But I wonder if you could give us your, your thoughts on that. I mean. As a society, you know, we're seeing cognitive you know, machines for the first time replace humans. You've expressed some concern about that privately. What can you share with our, our audience about that? And is there a prescription in your mind? Well, the short answer is I'm not sure. I mean, the longer answer is if you look at relatively modern, I'll call it cultural history, we've gone through a couple of major shifts that were super disruptive to society. You know, one is clearly the Industrial Revolution. It moved people off of farms and into cities. And it was very, very disruptive. And as a society, we eventually got through it. But you had wars, you had revolution, you had Marxist revolutionaries, you had fascist governments. It was a lot of work as a society to get through that. I do think we're going through a similar and equally disruptive change right now because we're starting to see uh, technology displace a lot of people's jobs. And the utopian will point out accurately that, yeah, there's seven and a half million people in the United States looking for work. There's six and a half million open jobs. So it's just, yeah, the jobs haven't gone away, they've just moved. The pragmatists, though, I, I don't think we can expect magically especially at today's rates, for people who used to be truck drivers to suddenly say, hey, I'm going to suddenly develop a passion to write code and go back to school and four years later be you know, a software engineer. It's not about intellectual ability, it's just they spent their life doing one thing, not going to go their way immediately. So to me, I'm not a utopian, I'm also not a doom and gloomer, but I do think we as a society need to expect to invest time, energy, thought, and resources into managing this transition. Because I think we're right at the beginning of it. If we don't get ahead of the curve, it's going to be bad for collectively us. So I do think it's very important for us not to view technology as an abstraction. It has impacts on society. And getting that right is just as important as getting the technology right. And just hearing you talk about that example of the truck driver, but. but you know, I feel like the answer may be in, in software. That truck driver is not going to be a coder potentially, but he, he or she is a domain expert. And that expertise could be applied to improve some kind of process or invent something even. Um, so we're not going to solve it here on theCUBE, obviously. <laughs> you talked about three other big trends. Um, timelines are compressing um, from years to months and sometimes even weeks. Uh, the second was da the data explosion. You have a great infographic. We talked about it earlier, so we don't have to re review it in detail. And then expectations, you know, this notion Absolutely. of thinking machines. Um, so how are you sort of ServiceNow, uh, you know, at the core, looking at those trends, and what, what does it, how does it inform you, and, and what can we expect going forward as a result? I think the super macro trend that I think we're seeing is that we're moving out of a structured data era 
you know, human beings, like this is a non-structured interchange. We're talking organically, it's language, it, it's imperfect. Uh, computers like perfect data. They like you to give them structured data and they're extremely good at managing it. And we as a society, at least as an industry, have probably spent the last 50 years trying to force society as a whole to act like computers. You know, fill in the form, put the data in the field. Right, right. And once you do that, the computers go off and do wonderful things. I do think that the real benefits to the average human being for automation is going to come from removing the need to use that kind of structured format. If you can just tell a machine, hey, my laptop's broken, hey, and they say, oh, we'll send a technician to fix it in 20 minutes. That's a radically different experience and better for you than having to fill in a form, a device that is broken, category, desktop hardware, you know, time onset of event, you know, right now, why do you need to ask me this? <laughs> so I do think that getting out of the structured data and into an unstructured interaction with machines, I think that's really the future. And I think you're going to find that there's going to be an intermediate layer of technology that abstracts between humans and between the computer systems we know today. So that you will interact with freeform text, with voice, potentially even with gestures, but you'll interact as a human and we won't try to force you to interact as a machine. And if you happen to be me, I sort of work well with forms. I may still choose to do that, but I don't think most people will. And I don't think I should make the world work the way I work. We're just seeing the very beginnings of that, right? With Alexa and Google and we the are Google just uh, Assistant and those kind of things, which are fun to play with because they still got a long way to go, but the early days. It is days. the camel's nose under the tent, yeah, but it is, yeah. it is coming. Well, and you gave the example today at CreatorCon of you've never sort of denied, I think it was maybe, maybe expense report or some kind of approval, ever. You know, it's always been, I mean, you look at them, because yep, you I have do. to. I'm a good corpus citizen, <laughs> I read them. Guys, I do read but, your expense reports. But machines can probably figure that stuff out. They can, um, and they already are in a lot of cases. The technologies are out there, and we're seeing our customer bases start to roll them out. Um, for me, it's really about making it easier to apply those technologies to more and more use cases. Because right now, they're somewhat specialized. You get one that's really good at approving expense reports. It's not so good at approving travel requests. Um, the next step up on that will be more general solutions. All right, Pat, we're out of time. Thanks so much for coming on theCUBE. It's really great to see you today. Absolutely, it's a pleasure. All right, always a pleasure. Thank you, guys. Thank Keep you it right much. there, buddy. We'll be back, day three, Knowledge 17. This is theCUBE.